The lecture today is on one of my favorite subjects, the evolution and the importance of cellular respiration. I get very excited when we start talking about this particular subject. The origins of eukaryotic cellular respiration actually has its origins back when life began almost 3.8 billion years ago. So as you can see by this wheel of time here, life has been around for a very long time on this planet. Life got started 3.8, 4 billion years ago. Now animals have been around for less than 600 million years. So why is that? And why did it take so long for cellular respiration to begin? When life began around 3.8, 4 billion years ago, it began as simply as it could. Therefore, the first cells were prokaryotic cells, and they've been around ever since. Within a very short time of life evolving on the planet, another remarkable invention of evolution occurred, and this was photosynthesis. So bacteria, specifically the cyanobacteria, they evolved the ability to take carbon dioxide and water and use the energy in sunlight and what they did is they converted that energy and sunlight to potential energy and fixed carbon into organic molecules. And as a byproduct, they released oxygen to the atmosphere. Well, that has some profound consequences for our Earth. Here's an illustration. And what it shows is the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. Now, this is on a log scale. So what that means is each one of those lines represents a tenfold increase in the amount of oxygen. So when life began about 3.8 billion years ago, there was no molecular oxygen in the atmosphere. Or if there was, it was really, really rare because it would immediately react with anything around it. So if it was produced, it didn't stick around for very long. Now sometime around 3.5 billion years ago, and probably much earlier, oxygenic photosynthesis evolved. Now oxygenic photosynthesis is the photosynthesis you're familiar with. That's the one that releases oxygen. Well, for the next several billion years, it kept pumping oxygen into the atmosphere and it slowly rose. Around 2 billion years ago, as atmospheric concentrations approached 1% or so, aerobic respiration evolved. And we're going to talk a lot about how aerobic respiration works next. And then, you know, oxygen levels got around 10%. At about that time, 500 million years ago, 600 million years ago, the very first animals evolved. And today, oxygen levels are about 22% of the Earth's atmosphere. It may be hard for us to believe, but oxygen is actually detrimental to a lot of different life forms, especially if they have no way of dealing with it. And the reason why is because oxygen is very electronegative. It likes electrons, and it can go up to organic molecules and snag those electrons and oxidize them. So oxygen can oxidize your membranes, and that can affect their functioning. It can oxidize your proteins. It can oxidize your DNA. So prokaryotes evolved a way to cope with oxygen. And one of the ways they did this is they evolved aerobic respiration. And that's respiration using oxygen. Quite simply, here's how aerobic respiration works. You take an organic molecule, like glucose. It doesn't have to be glucose. It could also be a fat or a protein. And we're going to react that with molecular oxygen. That is the same oxygen you breathe in on a daily basis. We're going to break it down to carbon dioxide and to water. Now this is an exergonic reaction. The products, carbon dioxide and water, have less potential energy than the reactants of glucose and oxygen. So this reaction releases energy. It's also a catabolic reaction. And what our cells do is take the potential energy in organic molecules and transfer that to ATP. And of course, some of that energy is always lost to heat to the environment. At this moment, I just want to take a step back, and I want to remind you of just how cool prokaryotes are. Don't forget, they evolved photosynthesis, and by releasing oxygen into the atmosphere, utterly changed the surface of the Earth and changed the course of evolution, because eventually, it was prokaryotes once again that evolved aerobic respiration. Once that happened, well, that paved the way for eukaryotes, and it began when two prokaryotes that were once separate living organisms merged together. And the aerobically respiring prokaryote, it got inside of another prokaryote. And what it could do is produce lots of ATP. And eventually, these cells grew larger and more complex. They evolved a cell nucleus. 
they evolved an endomembrane system to compartmentalize the functioning of the cell. And as they grew larger and more complex, they would eventually go on to form multicellular organisms. And to this day, only eukaryotes have evolved into multicellular organisms. There are no multicellular prokaryotes out there. So the question is, why? Why did aerobic respiration allow cells to become larger and more complex, and why did it evolve into multicellular organisms? The evidence supporting endosymbiosis is actually quite good. When we look at our mitochondria, they actually have circular DNA. That means the two ends of DNA are connected like a hula hoop. Our DNA, inside of a eukaryotic cell, is linear. It's like the two ends of the rope are not connected. They also have ribosomes that resemble bacterial DNA. Yes, all cells have ribosomes to make proteins, but there are small differences between eukaryotic and bacteria ribosomes. And when you look at our mitochondria, the ribosomes are much more like bacteria. So getting back to our original question, why did aerobic respiration pave the way for larger, more complex cells like eukaryotes and eventually to multicellular life? The answer goes back to energy. Remember, energy is the secret to life. Without a constant supply of energy, life could not exist. However, there's a catch to this. You have to have a usable form of energy for life. You just can't zap something in the microwave, we can't stand out in the sun, and we can't have lightning hit us to use that energy. No, we have to have energy in a usable form. That usable form of energy is ATP. ATP is the energy currency of life. So, aerobic respiration, or cellular respiration, makes much more ATP. So when you have oxygen present, if you've got one molecule of glucose, you're going to make more than just two ATPs. Now these are the steps of cellular respiration, glycolysis and Krebs cycle. And as you can see, if I had a molecule of glucose, I'm going to get about four ATPs total. However, the final step of cellular respiration uses oxygen, and it produces between 28 and 32 ATPs. So this is what you get with oxygen versus the four without, and that's enormous. So for every molecule of glucose that comes into a cell, you get much, much more ATP out. So the cells had more energy to work with. Having more ATP, that was a crucial step in the evolution of cells. Here's why. I already got the idea. Eukaryotic cells were able to evolve. You had this larger, more complex cell. And the story continues on from here. You see, mitochondria not only made eukaryotic cells possible, they also made multicellular life possible. So all the plants and fungus and animals, like this small lizard and this bird, all multicellular life, plants, animals, fungus, are made up of eukaryotic cells, and they require lots of energy to exist. It's a good thing that mitochondria make so much ATP, because it allows for a really active lifestyle, like your dog playing fetch, and your dog daydreaming to use a $6 million dollar dog, or the bionic dog, as he goes and leaps for his frisbee. So mitochondria make animal life possible, because without mitochondria producing all that ATP, we wouldn't be very active at all. Up to this point, I've talked a lot about the importance of mitochondria in producing energy for the cells, and that's how they led to the evolution of eukaryotes and multicellular life. And in fact, if you ask somebody, hey, what's the purpose of a mitochondria? Well, they'll tell you they're the powerhouse of the cell. However, mitochondria are way more important to our cells than just producing energy. For example, mitochondria and cellular respiration, they are central to eukaryotic metabolism. They are at the heart of both catabolic and anabolic processes. We can see that on this illustration. If you look at the middle on the blue and it says carbohydrate metabolism, that's glycolysis. That's the first stage of cellular respiration and it leads into that circle at the bottom that's the Krebs cycle. And as you can see, there are numerous chemical reactions that go into this and come out of that. So basically, they're breaking things down, extracting energy from it, but the cell is also taking those intermediate chemicals and using those to make other molecules inside of the cell. For thousands of years, humans have wondered, why do we age? 
and I'm not the only one to wonder. Here I am in December of 2004, and I'm kayaking in North Florida. 13 years later, here I am hiking in Big Bend National Park, with my friend Ian in the background. As you can see, I've aged. My face is slightly more wrinkled, and of course, most obviously, my beard is now gray. So what causes aging? First of all, aging is very complicated, but it turns out that mitochondria might be at least partly responsible for aging in animals. And the question is, why? How are they responsible? The theory linking mitochondria to aging is in free radical formation. You see, mitochondria are using oxygen, and sometimes it doesn't always work right, and oxygen picks up electrons from the mitochondria and forms free radicals, or reactive oxygen species. These are oxygen atoms that have an unpaired electron, and they're incredibly reactive, and they can damage cellular components. And we think that over time, as we age, we accumulate this oxidative stress. Now that being said, that doesn't mean you should go out and take mega doses of vitamin C or other antioxidants to reduce aging. It doesn't quite work like that. Our bodies are very finely tuned, and if you take too much antioxidants, that can actually be a bad thing. So just go eat healthy with lots of greens in your life. Now, these reactive oxygen species, one thing about them. Now remember this. Whenever you're talking about reactive oxygen species, or ROSs, don't get that confused with an ROUS, which is a rodent of unusual size. That's from The Princess Bride in 1987, and that is a fantastic movie, and it is kid-friendly, and I highly recommend it to everybody. In addition to being at the heart of our cellular metabolism and involved with aging, they also may have led to the evolution of programmed cell death, also known as apoptosis. It turns out to be a multicellular organism, all of our cells have a kill switch in them, and you actually have to have that. And as we grow and develop, we have cells that die between our fingers, and if it weren't for apoptosis, we'd all be born with webbed feet and hands. And we turn over our skin cells and other cells of the linings of our body daily. And if a cell becomes damaged or infected with a virus or becomes cancerous, it can commit suicide. So apoptosis was actually a very necessary part of becoming a multicellular organism, and we think that mitochondria helped evolve the ability to do that. The importance of mitochondria doesn't stop there. It continues. It turns out that almost all eukaryotes, not all of them, but almost all of them, have some form of sexual reproduction. We're going to learn about that one later. But basically, here are my parents. And sexual reproduction is you take the gametes from two different parents and you form an offspring. So I have 23 chromosomes from my dad and 23 chromosomes from my mom. I'm half of both of them. And that's sexual reproduction. And we think the mitochondria, there's actually very good evidence, supporting they led to the evolution of sexual reproduction in eukaryotes. And there's also really good evidence that the mitochondria not only led to the evolution of sexual reproduction, but it also led to the evolution of two sexes, male and female. And the evolution of sexual reproduction and two sexes has perplexed scientists for hundreds of years. And I'll discuss more of that when we talk about meiosis. But as you can see from this, mitochondria are very important. So now you can see why the mitochondria are my favorite organelle. Because in summary, they're responsible for the evolution of eukaryotic cells. And eukaryotic cells, of course, led to multicellular life. They are the heart of our cellular metabolism, both catabolic and anabolic reactions. They're responsible in part for aging. They're also responsible for the evolution of programmed cell death, also known as apoptosis, and, of course, sexual reproduction, and the evolution of two sexes.